want to fend for myself, and I, I want to build people up for them to fend for themselves. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Free Like Me podcast. I'm your host, Clark Fredericks. Guests come on, speak their truth, and leave free like me. We try to hear people's trauma, how they've overcome it, and give you some valuable tools for overcoming your own trauma, and to let you know you are not alone in the world. We are all facing something. We're all dealing with something, and we're all going to overcome something. We can do it. This week's guest is Hasia. She grew up in the Orthodox Jewish community, and she was going to give us an inside view into this secret sect. So it should be interesting. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Clark. So we met, uh, well, we, this is the first we've, we've met, but uh, we both did a podcast, uh, Soft White Underbelly, and you saw mine, and then you uh, started following me and reached out, sent a private message, and then I went and looked at yours, and uh, lo and behold, I started my own podcast, and I said, I have to have you on, and I'm thrilled that you're here. I'm truly honored. Yeah, this truly. Is, this is great. We've had some wonderful back and forth messages, and uh, I'm just super excited. I don't think, you know, I, I don't know if anybody in my audience is going to know really anything about the Orthodox Jewish community, and and I'm excited to just get a like pull the curtain back a little and get to see Oz and 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 see what goes on behind the curtain. Um, so can you can you take us into, you know, growing up in that community and what it was like? Yes. I first would like to say um, when I did uh, Soft White Underbelly, I did not make a disclaimer. And I want to make a disclaimer this time around that even though we're going to be talking about an upside down world and it's very foreign, I would like to mention that. Not everybody is bad, and a lot of people are good in these communities, and they're just born into it by default, and they're not in any way, shape, or form criminals or stuff like that. Sadly, though, I wasn't privileged to grow up in that innocence and that joyful part of that type of religion. I was born into a very, very strict cult-like religion. Um, Judaism was very, very, uh, very patriarchal, very much the women are... Is it go from like almost from family to family to family, how strict it is? Or, oh, is, yes. or is the whole... Yeah? So, so one family sects. could be... I, sects or like different... Maybe the word, like, there's different sects of Judaism. There's conservative, there's reform, there's orthodox, there's ultra-orthodox, there's Hasidic, there's Chabad. Uh, they believe in a different rabbi. You know, kind of like there's a whole bunch of uh, denominations, just like you would find in other religions. And, of course, lucky me, I get born into the cult-like sect of this religion now i've seen uh it, you know and if i come off of ig ig ignorance because i am ignorant of it's this just, it's this not community. even ignorant it's just not knowing because so who, very who wears uh like i i see the women always wearing the black wigs and the dress you know like the same dress they all look the same they all wear the wig is that part of orthodox um it's a very interesting thing. Just like the Amish, uh, we yeah, believe, they almost look like Amish. We believe that our hair is our crown of glory, and women, when they get married, they cover their hair and only save it for their husband. Uh huh. So, it's not they're not told that they have to look ugly. A lot of them are wearing ten thousand dollar wigs. Wow. A lot of them look beautiful. Right. But. The the point is is that their hair is only meant for their husband and it's also a gatekeeper. Because when you think about the fact that you have this beautiful hair piece on your head, you're gonna think twice before going off with a man, knowing that there's something on you that needs to be removed. And it's kind of like a gate to keep women modest. 
but still telling them you can look beautiful, you can have a Beyonce wig if you want. Um, obviously, in my sect, they don't have Beyonce wigs. They <laughs> they so become so religious to the point where they wear a wig and then they'll wear stuff over the wig. So just in case you think the wig is real here, they're going to put another covering so they'll have a double covering. Really? A that... double covering. Huh. Just so you know, this is not mine and that's the second covering over there. But... I would say that I was always told that being beautiful is not a sin, but it's definitely not something you want to be if you're born into the cult because you are always going to be looked at that you are causing men to sin. Uh -huh. So if you are born pretty, you are not going to get pretty privilege. You're going to get pretty prejudice. And immediately, women are not going to want their husbands around you because these men... My brother wasn't allowed to go to the mall even because there's billboards of sexy women. He cannot even see a picture of what a sexy woman looks like. Is that written down anywhere or is that just coming from the family that all of a sudden like It's extremist. Just, it's yeah, very just extremist. starts adopting some crazy thoughts. They'll say it's a gatekeeper. It's, it's, it's a way to make sure he doesn't stumble and fall. He'll see this beautiful woman and he'll get desires. He'll have the, the natural urges of a healthy man and he will go and he'll sin. So in order to make that not be the case, people, places, and things, they take to a cult-like level. All right, a question for you. There, you know, in, in society, it's about a 50% divorce rate. Is there divorce in in your community? I'm so happy that you brought that up. I couldn't thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> now, when we get married, we have a, a Jewish marriage. And if we want to get divorced, our husband has to grant us a Jewish divorce. Otherwise, a woman is by Jewish law not allowed to get remarried. She's considered what is called an aguna. She is basically stuck if she was to have any children they'd be considered bastards having a bastard child would be just like in the olden days with the kings and queens they're that archaic and they're that backwards about uh having children at, out of wedlock that is that will not fly and the child will suffer immensely are the marriages arranged mar Absolutely. marriages? Oh, they are. Absolutely. Every single one. Uh, like when it was time for me to get married, my mother would get phone calls. Oh, then being pretty suddenly came into, came into, that was maybe the one time that I noticed, oh, my mom was getting phone calls left and right. Hey, we have somebody for Hasia, this and that. And then they'd find out. Hasia doesn't toe the line. So instead of just being up front with me and saying, you know, He's too religious for you. They make up something stupid like, oh, he's looking for a tall girl and you're too short. You know, just keep it real. Keep it a hundred. But they couldn't. They, they didn't. They couldn't. So, you know, I dared to go out and find me my own man. Oh, that, that not knowing anything about the community, I can imagine that's that's frowned upon. But I was already such a disappointment and such a such a uh I don't know what to call it, but you, my parents already viewed me as the rebel, the the one that's gonna cause them the headache. So I'm sure they weren't that shocked, even though they always had to put up that shocked demeanor when I went and did not take my mother's advice and went and found my own. Is it, is this like you became a free thinker for yourself? And oh, I was that, always a free thinker. Is that like not frowned upon? You're just supposed to toe the line for whatever's told to you? So we have something called the Sabbath, and I would insist on going shopping for the Sabbath. And my mom had no idea that I would be in the book section because we're not even allowed to go on to like to public libraries. We're not allowed to read any books that aren't approved by my parents, which means there could even be Jewish books that are not allowed in the house. Like I said, every there's all different sects of Jew. And that is S-E-C-T-S, -E not sex, if it yeah. sounds like that. Um, so 
I would be going up to the aisle where there was all the romance novels, where there were all the juicy sex, you know, all the, uh, the, the white knights. And I was grabbing 10 of them and with my babysitting money, because I was always the babysitter of the block. I was buying all the romance novels and hiding them. And on the Sabbath, when my parents were sleeping, I was, you know, reading all these juicy, sexy stories. And you are you not supposed to read on the Sabbath? Uh, you can read, but you're definitely not allowed to be reading about romance, a, a romance novels novel. where this beautiful, handsome, muscular guy is falling in love with this beautiful woman. And, you know, romance novels are wonderful. And I'm a hopeless romantic. I admit it. Hey. And I, I ate it up. I absolutely ate it up. And sucks for me. I did not meet a hopeless romantic at all. Uh, but he was he he in his in his youth he was a very good looking person. I think I was deflecting my own beauty onto him because now as a divorced woman, whenever I see him, I'm just like cringing because it's like ew, like how did I find that attractive? But you know, I think we all have those love goggles, and once they're gone, you kind of see people for who they really are. And he definitely uh, wouldn't be my type now now. Nowadays, in age. now is it just the, uh, um, is it the Hasidic sect that has the the what's it dreidels? Uh, you're what hilarious. I call them pigtails. <laughs> yeah, right. Or is that in uh, your Orthodox sect also? They're called they're side locks. Which side would locks. Be, side locks would be the English word, and payot would be the Hebrew word for it, and Hasidics would call it payas. Was that so? Was that in your community? So, I mean, I definitely had cousins who were married to men that had them. My mom's parents lived in Bar Park, so when we'd go to temple, all the men had them. They were all speaking in Judeo German, which is Yiddish. Yiddish is Judeo German. They so if, like somebody starts to speak German around them, they're gonna understand it. Um, but my father's side was very different. My father uh, came from the Lower East Side. His family was very normal. But my father decided that he was going to become what's like a born again Jew, where he was going to be this ultra, 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 ultra religious, devout, pious, not go in his family's footsteps, but be above and not... holier than thou. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what brought that on in him? You would have to ask him. Right. I think that the respect that he got from the family, I think the fact that. Uh, when you become ultra religious, you're going to turn to people and say, I'm sorry, but that I'm not allowed to do that or I can't do this or I can't do that. And you're going to get catered to always because they look at it like this is a rabbi. You know, I am a rabbi's daughter. It's like your father was a rabbi. Oh, my father is a rabbi. Is he is a rabbi. People from Israel will call him when they have a question. My dad understands Aramaic. My dad if he only took his brilliant brain and became a surgeon or a doctor and became a healer, but instead he used his brilliant brain to know every single book like that are in the old 2,000-year-old languages. He knows them all by heart. And I have to say, he's, he is a brilliant man. I do enjoy speaking with him. But when it comes to whenever I want to challenge him, he's, he's not going to hear it. He's he he can't allow a window to open where he's going to see that I can prove that what you're saying doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And what I'm saying is truth because he is stuck in an archaic world. He does not want to come into the modern world. He doesn't want a TV. He doesn't want Wi-Fi. He has a kosher phone. You can't text on those phone even. Like he does, it's his will. His will is to stay as far away from the modern world as possible and be in this cult where he never sees women. Women are kept separate always. Even when we go to temple, there's a huge separation you not even see through. And the women are put away upstairs in a corner where we have to peek through a, a curtain if we want to watch during holidays. Really? Yeah, there's a holiday where we get the Torah and we dance around in big circles. And in our sect, like the women, we have to peek through. And if you dare open it too much, my mom would 
you know, close it. You know, you don't want the men looking up at the girls. You know, they're just not living in the real world and acknowledging the fact that boys like girls and girls like boys and things are going to happen if you try to deny what is natural. Instead of teaching and being open-minded and saying, hey, this is reality, what they do is they inadvertently weak. They, they weaken us. So, like, when we come out into the world, we're not prepared for the streets. We're not. Everything that we come is learning by making mistakes. I always say there's a lesson and a blessing, both. You know, when you have that lesson, it's a blessing because smart people learn from other people's mistakes. Of course, I was the dumbass who had to make my own mistakes. <laughs> and my sisters would always say to me, because I'm one of eight, and my mom was pregnant a total of 13 times, but being pregnant that often, when they're not, a lot of people were wondering, where were the other five kids? My mom miscarried them. My mom even had such a bad miscarriage where she almost died. She needed blood transfusions. And she still got pregnant again after that and had my my youngest brother. So there's eight of us. I'm number four. I'm smack in the middle. And what what does sex look like in in that community? Okay, I, so the white sheet thing, that's complete bullshit. That's a myth. That's a complete myth, <laughs> unless there's something I don't right, know. Right, right. You've never heard of that. But I right. know from going cutting a, to- Cutting a hole in the white sheet. <laughs> that's, yeah, that was all just a myth. It's oh. definitely a myth. Right, okay. We are supposed to be one, as one. It's supposed to be beautiful. It's supposed to- um, Is it always supposed to be just to procreate? Or are you allowed to... The proof that we're told that that's not the case is that we don't get our period when we're pregnant. And we're still sexually active when we're pregnant. So pleasure is just as important as... But what the thing is not allowed is a man is not allowed to ejaculate outside of a woman. And that's when a lot of marital rape happens. So tell me, as a child growing up in that community, what, what led to your nightmares? What What... Where, where did the pain and the torment and the trauma come from? I think the first biggest, biggest, biggest pain and sadness is, is that nowadays we do not look at neurodivergent people, people who have different brain wiring. We don't look at them as pity cases anymore. If anything, we look to get them extra help. We look to make sure the teachers are aware. We look to make sure that they are given separate classes so that they can cater to their different brain wiring because at the end of the day, people have different brain wiring. A lot of people don't like diagnosis because back in the day, you got a diagnosis that you were autistic. People looked at you like you were a pity case. People looked at you like you were had I'm not going to mention any of those things because they're not appropriate nowadays to put people down for things that they didn't choose. I did not choose to have ADHD. And anytime I dare even mention that I could have more than just ADHD, my therapist shut it down because I'm so high functioning and I'm such a good masker that they're like, it's CPTSD. And, and, and that's why you do and you have your little tics and that's why you do what you do. But I know... Because I live in my body and I live in my brain that I tend to relate much more with neurodivergent people than I do with neurotypical people. A lot of people get pissed off about it. And the biggest, 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 biggest sin was that none of us were going to go and get proper diagnoses. So we lived not knowing that we were soaring doves and we thought we were defective fish. And we thought we had to cover up and pretend that we were neurotypicals when we were not those things. So automatically when you're put in a situation where you have to pretend to be something you're not, you're automatically like when they would, in the olden days where you were born left-handed, which I am, in the time of the Holy Temple, we were told that if a Kohen they were the holiest of priests. And if they were left-handed or had dimples, those were considered defects. And I forgot which king it was. Um, they made a movie about him. They would tie his left hand behind his back and force him to use his right hand. And he developed a stutter. 
because we have, we're left-handed. It's not a defect. If anything, it's badass. We fall into this very low percentile. And I've noticed that left-handed people always have amazing handwritings. They're no different from right-handed people. We just struggle more because we live in a right-handed world where everything is catered to right-handed people. When I was a little girl, I had to learn how to use right-handed scissors if I wanted to learn a musical instrument, dance, anything. It's for right-handed people. This is coming from your, your mother, your father? Everything about me was me having to learn how to be something I wasn't. Because nobody took the time. My mom was overwhelmed. She was pregnant and barefoot. The typical picture that is in your head. And she worked. My mom, when I think about it, is a badass. She always fit two jobs in and did everything she had to do. But so, so the women are allowed to work in your community? Not just allowed. They're they're lied to and told that they're building their world to come if they let their husbands go and not work and sit and learn Bible all day, the Torah all day. I so have, they're actually looked at to be the breadwinner? So, so the husband my poor can just... sister-in-law is popping out a kid every year. Each one is coming out worse than the one before. Like, can't walk serious 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 issues very late developmentally and it's like they're just thinking god is blessing us meanwhile no they are they're they're doing where their sex life you asked about our sex life it's policed by 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 the bible and what happens is is we're called needham when we have our period so it's disgusting. We're kind of shunned. We're banished. We're not allowed to be touched. We're told we're impure while we have our period. Meanwhile, we should celebrate getting our period because I know I didn't get my period for so many years because I have two autoimmune systems. I couldn't get pregnant. So I never thought I had a baby. So my baby's a miracle baby. She's, she's, she's literally a miracle baby because to get your period is a beautiful thing. It means your body's healthy, but in their, in their world, if you do the science, what it is is are you the set- uh, when you when you have a baby, are you allowed to have a doctor outside of the Jewish community to to give birth, or if your child is born with ailments that needs physical therapy, are you allowed to see a physical therapist outside of the community or anytime? So take anytime us into time. Non Jews are needed, of course. Oh, it is allowed, allowed to come in. Anytime, and I always love to challenge when ultra religious people talk badly about what they call them as Gentiles, they call them Gayim. They use very derogatory terminology. And this is where I come from, not the normal secular ones, the just the ones that are American or whatever, the ultra cult ones. They do sadly look down because we're told we're God's chosen, we're told we are the light unto the nations. We are, when the Messiah comes, we are the ones that are going to be brought up from death. We're going to have Tchias HaMesim is what what it's called. We're going to rise up from the grave and we're going to go to Israel and we're going to have a Messiah come from Tzifat, which is a town in Israel. And the talking donkey is going to appear and the Messiah is going to be riding the talking donkey. (laughs) And it sounds like fairy tales to me. It's, it's, It's hilarious, actually, when you think with a normal, real brain. So they have this big belief that they have to be amazing and follow 613 commandments because they want to be a part of when the Messiah comes. Is there racism in that community? Like, oh, and- within their own? So much, so you can't even imagine outside. Prejudice, racism, it, bias. Within their own community is so, 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 so disgusting. I would go, let's say, shopping, and a random Jewish stranger would walk up to me and start screaming at me for the way that I was dressed or the way that I looked or, you're ashamed to our people and this and that. And back then, now I, I straight up black out and... I'm not responsible for what comes out of my mouth because you come for me, you go low, I'm going to hell. I mean, do like eventually you have to build the armor. You well, got, how, you how would a stranger right now know that you're in, uh, 
part of the Orthodox they wouldn't, community. Because right, because I'm looking at you and I, I, wouldn't I wouldn't tell anything. Yeah, I wouldn't at this point in my life right. ever, ever dishonor my identity as who I am for the approval of others. If you don't like what you see, unfollow, turn around, walk the other way. And if you want to start shit, there's going to be shit. Like so, so, back then I was a victim. I would start crying because I was used to my mother constantly berating me. Oh, my, and my mom was no shame. If, if she deemed me like I was not even allowed to say what I would have to say yes. When she called me, she would literally beat me in public. And when I got my balls was when my daughter was born. Because when I was literally just out of the hospital, my mom was already threatening to beat me. And I remember something in me changed. And I looked at my mother. I said, if you touch me, I will beat you back. And immediately my mother became the victim. How dare you? And I pulled out a chazal, which is, is like a saying that she likes to. I know how to use my education back on them. And I said, Habala you come for me, I'm going to rise up and I'm going to defend myself. She also saw me one time, my daughter, I never put her down. She was my miracle child. She changed me completely. My mom saw me during that 10-day period that I confused between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur because it's a time of repentance. They blow that phallic horn. You know, they, it's a whole, like, it's not just that they blow it. They have, like, little notes that they do. It's a whole thing. It's, it's, and it's... Reminding you to come and return, repent, repent for your sins. And during those 10 days, my mom saw me in ShopRite and my baby strapped with my baby Bjorn, and I was dressed completely like a normal American. My mother walks up to me in the middle of ShopRite, people milling around. She takes her fist, bangs it on my head, and is like, In the middle of a Sarah's made to Shuva? which means in the middle of the 10 days of repentance, you don't have your hair covered. And I just, I looked down at my daughter and like a rage came over me. A lot of people wanted to know what sign I am and I am a fire sign. So there is the fire in me. I can't control it. And immediately I did, didn't want to lower myself to her level, even though I wanted to just throat punch her. Um, I think there's a certain respect. It's not respect, it's indoctrination. We would hear stories as little kids about like rabbis who would give these big speeches in front of thousands of men and the mother would come and spit on them because they weren't fully there or whatever. And the rabbi wouldn't ever lose his cool on his mother and would always make sure to keep the commandment and the, the Ten Commandments is respect thy mother and thy father. And they would... Tell us stories like that. So if your mother committed a crime of violence on you, you keep the respect and you take it. So you hear stories like that. So there's this indoctrination. And I feel like when they do it from birth, it's hard to fully break out. But it, I'm on that journey of, and my daughter at that point kicked me into gear and I immediately walked away. And my mom followed me. Like, she was like a stalker. She followed me around ShopRite, walked up when I was checking out, and, like, just would not let me go. Like, I was a piece of property still to her. And I wish I called the cops on her, but I didn't. I didn't dare. If her reaction when you were an adult after having a child was to hit you, what was it like when you were a young girl? Growing, oh growing my up. god my mom so take take me into any violence or any extremism she, or any this is how i know my mom has favorites because she has the golden child she never beat my brother she never beat one of my little sisters my mother despised me she despised my oldest brother who did the 10-year bid in in jail um and my mother despised my younger sister. And us three got it so horrifically. Even to the point where now I've done enough therapy to realize I was my dad, I was daddy's girl because I was very much like his mother. And my father did love me a lot. He always gave me special treatment. 
I was allowed to sleep in his bed when nobody else was allowed to. Um, he would take me out. And I would say, like, when I really broke his heart was when the schools told him, we're sorry, we can't take your daughter. She's just too too much of a bad influence on the girls here, and you got to send her away. And it that was when, but any time I see him, there's just, whether it be emotional incest, whether it be whatever it is, there's a twinkle in his eye. I know no matter what. I think, I hope, I could call my dad. I mean, you said you were your father, one of your father's favorites, not your mother's favorite. Oh, and you were allowed. I learned in therapy. That's why my mom was probably hated me because my father allowed for me to be the love of his life. Was there any sexual abuse in your history? Absolutely. My yeah. father's father is a, a pedophile, and my brother is a pedophile. It would be so bad to the point that my grandfather would molest my cousins. And we would just stand and watch while my cousin would molest my baby sister. She would yank her pants down. And all the adults would act like nothing was going on. And I'm, be I'm guilty of the same thing. But I was a child when this would happen. But it never left my memory seeing my sister helplessly naked while my cousin would have her way with her on the couch in the living room in the playroom and till this day that shit haunts me and like if i would ever see and none of the adults said, would what? say anything it was almost like what what the eye doesn't see we don't have to acknowledge type but now knowing that my grandfather was a pedo I have a lot of resentment to my father because he was allowed to live in our house until he died. Uh -oh. So, And what was his role in the community? What, what did he do for a living? Was he a rabbi also? I don't know much about my grandfather. Okay. What he did? Okay. Maybe it was a form of protection, but they always used the excuse that he wasn't religious enough for us to go around there. So visits were, were sparse. Uh. But, Even though he's living in your household? But what happened was he started to get sick, and oh. he couldn't care for himself. And we had a whole basement apartment. So, of course, my mom, the ever uh, embittered martyr that she is, uh, took in, which is amazing. But she was never happy about it. She, was, she shouldn't have. We should have never heard my grandmother shrieking. They both died horrific deaths. And as children, we witnessed... Things that know, like your worst nightmares, you should not see. Like the end stages of Alzheimer's, the end stages of whatever. My grandfather had his legs. The skin was falling off and like the, the flesh was raw. His back was so curved, like he looked like the hunchback of Notre Dame. He went out bad. He went out bad. And my grandma, I'm almost happy that she, even though she suffered so much, the kind of husband that she had, at least the Alzheimer's, blanked out her memory. So whatever pain she may have carried with her, at least when it was her time, her brain was blank. She had to know what he was that he was a pedophile? And, I, I, and I, she have to like just keep her mouth shut about it in that community? I would have to believe there's two ways to go about pedophilia. Denial, acceptance you keep it a secret right. it's much much easier to keep it a secret because nobody likes a truth teller nobody likes the whistleblower right. nobody wants to be around the girl that talks i found out the hard way going on soft white underbelly that people are now scared of me people now don't want to have anything to do with me because guess what she's gonna talk so in 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 your in that community, I mean, all right. So you the you upside have, down world I t keep yeah, talking about. Yeah, I mean, you. I so should you be have, praised for talking. You, you <laughs> have firsthand knowledge of a pedophile in your family, and then other sexual abuse. Is it? Is it? I mean, would you would you hear your classmates talk about it in their families? Or was it? Is it? Is it widespread? I think anybody who has this sickness will have two reactions. 
when someone's house gets burned down, their personality splits, right? As a child, you have that split. Two things happen. You start burning other people's houses to the ground or you start building other people's houses up. I was the kind of person who was a builder. I wasn't going to go because I knew what it felt like. And that's what I'm trying to do is build people. There you go. So because I knew what it felt like to have my house burned down, I wanted to be a healer. But people who become healers need healing more than anybody else in the world. Right. That's why you're here. <laughs> That's why I do this. You know? So if we sit in silence and ruminate on I have been our in crap, a, I have been in a functional freeze. Functional freeze. Yes. That is what I call it. Right. Yes. Have you ever had therapy? I'm very, very, very pro therapy, but unfortunately, becoming friends with therapists, I've heard a lot of very, very, very alarming things. First, I went to a domestic violence therapy place, and I knew she was on uppers. Her pupils were so huge. She had no emotion. The first thing she did when she walked in was tell me, I have no experience in the type of trauma you have, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to help you. So my first mistake was me expecting a me instead of seeing, because I'm an esthetician, I'm a licensed esthetician, If someone comes in with a new type of skin condition, I celebrate because now I have a new skin condition I've learned about and I can help every new person who comes and lays down in my chair. When I see that skin condition, I know what to do for you and I can help you. She didn't have that attitude. She had that attitude of, I don't want to touch you with a 10 foot pole. And I need someone who is not cold. I'm a very emotional human being. I was told on the grid of sensitivity, she pointed to the sensitivity part, and then she said, now go 10 steps up. You're on the 10th up here where you can't even see it. That's how sensitive a person you are. And that's my cross I have to bear. And I've always tried to close it off, my sensitivity. Instead of embrace it and make it my superpower, I've hated that I have that, that I can pick up on bad vibes. I'll tell you a story. I was with my best friend and I told her, I said, we're being followed. She didn't believe me. We ended up in the um, train. She lived on Roosevelt Island. Guy was standing over us, dick out. He's jerking off, standing over me. I'm a young girl, and I'm rocking back and forth because that is the only time when I'm under pressure, I fold, and I don't focus. When I am under pressure, I will focus. I will not fold. My daughter once, I accidentally didn't realize that the water temperature had changed in the bathtub, and I accidentally burned her. Within five minutes, I had her red belly turned white again. I did not lose, even though she was covered in soap. I called my sister, who's a RN. She may be even a PA by now. T- tell me what to do immediately. Like, didn't, didn't freeze. My ex just stood there and stared. I'm like, what are you doing? And I had to realize he could be a freezer not a focuser, you know? And I was pissed at him that he just stood and stared. And I'm bounding down the stairs, you know, and scooping her up. But with my daughter, when she, I have OCD about certain germs. When she sees me distressed, because it's not often, she laughs so uproariously. She laughs so hard at me. And I want to be like, are you kidding me? Like, where's the nurturing? Why aren't you helping me? But I learned that neurodivergent people can actually laugh at inappropriate times. Like when I found out my friend overdosed, to my horror, I started laughing. And I couldn't control myself. It was the only time it happened, thank God. And I was apologizing to everybody in the car. And I just was laughing my head off. Thank God that's never happened again. And sadly, there have been many more overdoses. But why I I I have to to tell everybody when I do a pre-interview that 
look, when you go through your trauma, I may have a laugh. I go, it's not to demean you in any way. It's just a a, 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 a response, a That's nervous excellent. response or something. I That's do the same thing. That's excellent that you give them the respect yeah, to let I have them to say, know. Please don't take offense to it. Cause That's I, I excellent because I took offense to it. There was a B on me and i do not like bees because i have a trauma story with bees remember there's a religious holiday that we have it's called the where they build those huts you ever go it's like right in the beginning of september it's after yom kippur where they build those huts and there's these little it's amazing if you go into a jewish community everybody has these little huts on their porches or in their backyards and they eat there the men sleep there it's a whole crazy, crazy, crazy religion that, thank God, I have no part of anymore. <laughs> it's too much. But either way, my mom heard me screaming when we were in the hut, and she had no idea why. But I was screaming bloody murder, and she knew something was wrong. Unfortunately, a bee, because we use honey. We dip the bread in honey for a sweet year. And the honey brought bees. And the bee went in my diaper, couldn't get out. It was a wasp. They don't die when they sting you. And the wasp was stinging my privates over and over and over and over. Aye. So the only time I um, was not terrified of a bee was when I was um, on something and I was able to not immediately go into a fear-based, trauma-based state of mind. I said, I know you're not here to hurt me. Please get off my leg because I'm scared. And he listened to me, and he flew away. This time around, I was not on any sort of therapeutic thing to help me get through my fear. But I didn't scream or anything like that. I held very still. But the look of terror went over my face, and my daughter just started laughing. And that bee smelled the Chanel and did not want to get off my neck. And I am just folding i'm not focusing and my daughter is laughing at me and i want to kill her because i need her help so badly right now and she's such a good kid she she always helps me with groceries but seeing her superhero mom be human made her go crazy with roaring with laughter finally i grabbed my sleeve what felt like for an eternity and i brushed it and he could i had a cap it could have flown into my face, but thank God it didn't. All ends that ends well. But all right, you you, you mentioned something. And just another question about your community, your former community. Is there drug and alcohol use? Lots of alcohol use. Lots We're commanded of alcohol. to drink alcohol. Even the children drink alcohol. Really? Yes, there's a lot of alcohol use because it's a sign of celebration. It's also uh, certain holidays were commanded to be so drunk that we don't know the difference between the perpetrator and the saint. Um, the Sabbath, everybody drinks, myself included. My father drinks, all the boys drink. They make blessings over wine. It's a very accepted uh, thing because of our culture, liquor. There's a lot of alcoholics in our community, a lot of weekend alcoholics. There's lots of women that like their wine, um, but I believe addiction goes in every community. It doesn't matter how religious you are. It doesn't matter how not religious you are. It doesn't matter you're white, you're black, you're brown, you're caramel, you're right. cinnamon, you're albino, whatever it is, we know addiction does not discriminate. All right. So, oh, so it's in that community as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Right. It's in every community. And it, so... You, I mean, is the term you've broken free from from the Orthodox community? You can is never that, break free. You can never break no. free. No. <laughs> I think until my parents pass away, and I think until um, other people pass away for the rest of my life, the pain lives in my body. Unless I get lucky enough to be able to heal in this lifetime with those ghosts and demons that are still around because you stay posted with your demons. And when they're alive, how do you overcome what is alive? 
how do you eradicate it once something is either cremated or put under and you know it's heart's not beating anymore you know it's not coming for you anymore i have a phobia of footsteps i had no idea that that thing existed that there is a phobia for footsteps until i moved into a basement and i didn't understand why the footsteps upstairs were making me become enraged enraged and i found out through research that there is a phobia for footsteps and we can of course do the math in our heads from hearing footsteps to come to me that i knew what was going to happen made me forever always be able to decipher whose footsteps are who i know in the home that i live in right now whose footsteps are who because again i am in a place where people live upstairs from me so you would know growing up Who's, whose footsteps always. were going to oh, be a I physical had, I beating. Had romantic books might be a sexual, sex. be, a sexual I had to know attack. when mom or dad were coming up the stairs to quickly hide that book I right. mean I was in survival mode from a very 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 young age so my cortisol was pumped I had gut issues um since I can remember still are you do. still in touch with your parents no Absolutely not, because um, what's very, very, very odd is they have chosen to side with my perpetrators and not with me. And I have, now that I'm a mother, and I've watched my mother forbade me to do so many things, and she would always quote the Torah, but she doesn't give me the same grace she expects for herself. So if she's not going to respect my boundaries... And I understand that my boundaries are not her boundaries, but she doesn't respect my boundaries. So because of that, I have to teach my daughter that people who don't respect your boundaries, you have to cut them off. Because that's when you become the sacrificial lamb. And that's when you... Right. It, it, it's a, a slippery slope. You know, when I, when, I was, uh, when I was in prison, I got into a, a group therapy class, and it wasn't for just like molestation victims it was for trauma victims who had trauma in in their childhood and there was guys in there who just had the most evil parents imaginable and yet they were still trying to stick up for them and the therapist is like just because somebody has the label mother or father doesn't mean they've earned the right to be your mother or father if they've done nothing but evil, horrific acts. I read a beautiful quote to add to what you're saying. Every yeah. child deserves a parent, but not every parent deserves a child. Yeah, there it is. Right. That's exactly right. You know, heating up, um, you know, metal coat hangers on the stove and burning them and, and holding their head under water and throwing them into a basement, taking all the light bulbs out in the basement and then throwing the child in the basement and locking the door and keeping them down there for days where they have to live in the cold, damp basement and and, and urinate and, and defecate down in the basement in the dark. And then and then you wonder why they end up in prison. And then, and then you know, and yet they still wanted to protect the nature of having a mother or father and the therapist would be like no That's you, know, you have to cut them out That's like like you just you know like let's try to sum up i always like to try to give uh the audience you know some valuable tips you know on on healing and how have you how have you grown from what you grew up in how have you tried to heal how have you overcome you know what would what are some of the things that have helped you in your life to get where you're at I would have to say the cliche having my daughter. No, that's not cliche. Because you should want to do things for yourself, but the self-love might not be there yet. Right. My daughter, when she's around, she not only keeps me accountable, she brings me an energy that sometimes goes away when she's not with me my higher purpose comes back. And when you take someone's child from them, which is what's happening to me, I haven't found the answers to how to survive without my baby. 
one thing I want to ask to close is, do you have faith? Do you believe in God? Sometimes when I lose faith in God, he never loses his faith in me. So I know you asked me to pray for you on your drive here. Well, yeah. And I, <laughs> and I wondered... You the know, check w- engine light turned on. <laughs> I wondered, it wasn't just, you know, I, I want to incriminate myself. I wondered my where st- you stood after being raised. I love and, God. And you love God. I know love that God. God is not responsible for human free will. Right. Uh, bing, that is bingo. what differs bingo. us from animals. Bingo. And animals ride off of instinct. And what makes us different from animals is that we do have free will. And we, we can decide to change that pathway. We could be going this way. We could go fear off. We can, whatever it is, there's 30 different pathways to the top of the mountain, right? The cliche that they right. say. So yes, I, I, but sometimes I also feel very afraid. And I feel like when you feel so scared, do you believe in God that he's going to make miracles happen for you? There should be no fear then. But I feel a, a lot of fear. But, you know, I am going through a lot right now because I chose to tell the truth. And truth tellers get punished. They don't get celebrated. They don't. People have left me comments like, well, if you didn't talk so much shit about us, I would donate to your GoFundMe. But because you talked shit about us, why should I help you? You know? Right. Just proving my point, you right. know? But there were some people that were kind and made contributions and thank you to the people that have. I appreciate it so, so much. And, you know, I do like to put on, you know, a pretty dress. and But it doesn't mean that what's going on behind closed doors, like I said, masking is something that I'm very good at. But it doesn't mean that just because I look a certain way that behind closed doors, you know, the foundation, you know, is has some cracks in it exactly right well exactly. that's why i had you on to uh you know uh hey being honesty transparency it's the only uh real true path to growth and healing and uh and, yeah and uh, you know so i wanted that for you and I, I wanted to hear some insides of of a, a community that very few people know about um so I thank you for uh, opening up and uh, sharing some of that with us. Absolutely. And if you have any other burning questions, any <laughs> myths that you think exist, uh, I'd be I th- more I think than I... happy to answer if it's true or not. Yeah. <laughs> no. But the sheet one the, is the only The only myth true. I ever heard yeah. was the sheet. <laughs> yeah, we're commanded to be fully naked and be one and to be together. And it, it's supposed to be a beautiful experience. Right. Wonderful. Yeah. All right. Thank you, my dear, for being here and for and Clark, uh, sharing. I just want to end this, that when I saw your story, you helped me so much. Your story was the top story that helped me. And that's why I reached out to you. I have not reached out really to anybody else because I think most people are not in a good state when it comes to healing, but I could tell that you really put the work in as well and that you really you're not just talking the talk you are walking the walk and your story just I it just hit me like a bullet and you are incredible and thank you for giving me this time because time and attention is the most expensive currency we have and I come consider myself so blessed that I could be in your presence and have an audience with you. And I hope we can be friends and absolutely. Thank you. I'm honored. Thank you. All right, everybody. There was another episode of free like me. Wow. Uh, we just got to touch the water of, of, of a secret, uh, community that, uh, I knew nothing really about. And, uh, um, I'm so glad to uh, find out more. And uh, like any community, there there's good people and bad people. There's uh, trauma. There's addiction. Uh, it 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 follows follows us everywhere. Um, but we can overcome. We can heal. We can grow. 
And I hope you just realize that uh, we are not alone. We are all in this together and we're all dealing with something. So thank you for being here. Hit the su subscribe button. I can't even get that out. Hit the subscribe button, people, on uh, YouTube and uh, keep following. Thank you. Peace.